My role is to make a few introductory comments and then introduce our two speakers. Once they've concluded, it will then be open to the floor for comments and questions. My starting point is that democracy and the rule of law may be seen as the twin pillars of a liberal democracy. However, there are three challenges that we face in seeking to maintain a balance of the essential pillars or between those two pillars. And I really just want to outline what those challenges are. Well, the first is a simple one of actually defining the terms. It's easy to give lip, con uh, lip service to concepts such as the rule of law when we don't have to be precise as to what it actually means. Some years ago, I published an article which identified different uses of the term. What precisely do we mean by the term other than that the law is paramount? Does it refer to procedural and substantive rights? Does it refer to who is brought within the remit of the law? Magna Carta established for the first time that the king was subject to the law, but what exactly does the rule of law entail? Democracy is also a contested concept. Demos kratia, rule of or by the people. But how is it to be put into effect? In a society in which people are too numerous to gather as a whole, how are those who are to govern chosen? What are they permitted to do? And with what degree of accountability? Second, even if the definition is clear, where does one place the emphasis? Can one maintain a perfect balance between democracy and the rule of law? A constitution may seek to achieve a balance, but is a perfect balance possible? We know what constitutions are, we can define what a constitution is, but there's less agreement on what they are for. Some see a constitution as a form of constraint. It's a means of limiting public authority. That's sometimes referred to as negative constitutionalism. The constitution is designed in order to give priority to certain values, to protect rights, and does so by putting them beyond the purview of the majority will and a transient majority in the legislature. At the other end of the spectrum, we have positive constitutionalism, which sees the constitution as a means of ensuring that the general will prevails. The will of the majority takes precedence. So negative constitutionalism, in effect, emphasizes the liberal part of liberal democracy, and positive constitutionalism emphasizes the democratic side of liberal democracy. Third, who protects each pillar? Does not the legislature speak for the people? Do not the courts act as the protectors of rights? What's the relationship between the two bodies? Cannot the people's representatives claim to have a role in protecting the rights of citizens? So that's where I put forward three models of legislative judicial relations. The first is the respective autonomy model. Here, there's a relationship between the executive and the legislature deciding what the law should be and between the executive and the judiciary resolving challenges brought against public authority. What is missing is a meaningful relationship between the legislature and the courts. The two elements of a liberal democracy are seen as discrete. The legislature exists as the democratic element, ensuring that the wishes of the people are heard and represented in the determination of public policy. The courts exist as the liberal element, ensuring that the law, 
constitutional and statutory are interpreted, is interpreted and applied. So each leaves the other to fulfill its dedicated role. The second model is the competing authority model. Here there's a relationship between the legislature and the courts, but it's an adversarial one. The legislature claims its position to speak for the people and the public good, challenging the claim of the courts to impinge on its capacity to determine the law. The courts assert their competence to interpret and apply the law. There is the potential for clashes between the two and indeed, as a consequence, instability in the polity. The third model is the democratic dialogue model. Here, there is a relationship between the legislature and the courts, but it is not an adversarial one, but one of constructive engagement. There is a case for both to be involved, especially so in systems where courts can only deal with cases and controversies brought before them. They have no formal capacity to be proactive in the protection of rights. The legislature has such a capacity. And in a system where parliamentary sovereignty applies, is the body with ultimate responsibility for approving measures stipulating the rights of the citizens. Where a legislature enacts a measure protecting human rights, the courts are then protecting rights embodied in a document that, as Alison Young puts it, has a democratic pedigree. The role of the courts is to interpret the measure. Now, in, in doing so, uh, they are open to the claim they're giving priority to the wishes of a democratically elected body of a particular generation. That is the generation that enacted the uh, document. There's also the problem that, given the likely broad terms of the measure, uh, judges may reach conclusions at variance with what the Parliament intended, just give, thus giving rise to claims of judicial lawmaking. But the value of inter-institutional dialogue, or comity, is that, as Young argues, it furthers stability and instigates a form of checks and balances between the courts and the legislature. It facilitates achieving the balance between the liberal and democratic sides of a liberal democracy, with both courts and parliament recognising that each has a legitimate role and that each needs the other if rights are to be protected effectively. The courts are best placed to interpret the law, but the legislature is the body that can enact wide-ranging measures to protect rights and indeed enact in law new rights whose moral validity has only recently been conceded. Furthermore, Parliament may have a role in protecting the courts from executive encroachment. Even in parliaments dominated by a single party executive, it may be possible to create an institutional means of engaging in a discourse with the courts and serving as a buffer between the courts and the executive. There is thus the potential for achieving a balance. The challenge is to grasp what we mean by democracy and the rule of law and to ensure that they're seen as compatible and not competing. Well, how then to achieve that? So to enlighten us, we have two very distinguished speakers uh, on my far left, Sir Edward Garnier, and on my immediate left, Professor Fernan Bogdaner. Uh, Sir Edward Garnier QC is the Member of Parliament for Harborough, having been first elected in 1992, and a distinguished uh, lawyer. He was called to the bar in 1976 and made a Queen's Counsel in 1998. He served as a Crown Court Recorder and he was appointed Solicitor General in 2010, serving until 2012, and was knighted in 2012. Vernon Bogner is seen as one of the United Kingdom's leading constitutional authorities. He was for many years Professor of Politics at Oxford University, he taught David Cameron, and is now Professor of Government at the Institute of Contemporary British History at King's College London. 
He has written widely on constitutional issues, among his most recent books being The New British Constitution and The Coalition and the Constitution. Sir Edward is going to address the rule of law, uh, primarily, and Professor Bogner will look at constitutions, and particularly the link with democracy and the rule of law. So, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Sir Edward Garnier. Well, good morning, and thank you, Philip, very much indeed for your introduction and for your introductory words. Having been um, asked to focus on what we mean by the concepts of democracy and the rule of law, I want in particular uh, to draw on my own experiences in supporting, developing and implementing the rule of law during my career, both uh, as a member of the bar here in London, where my practice for the last nearly 40 years has focused predominantly uh, on the interaction and conflict between uh, freedom of expression and the right to privacy and reputation. Uh, as a British Member of Parliament since 1992 uh, and as a Government Minister. Uh, nowadays, uh, we describe that conflict through the prism of the European Convention on Human Rights and, in particular, Articles 8 and 10, but it is a conflict that has been dealt with for centuries under the common law of England uh, and through statute. And Despite our 60-year or so membership of the Convention and our ability since the implementation of the Human Rights Act of 1998 to have convention points uh, decided in the English courts. Uh, this is an area of conflict that is still very much affected by the common law of England. Uh, as a member of parliament, I have legislated twice in the last 20 years to adjust the law of defamation in this country, although I can't say that the law has been greatly improved by either statute. And I have participated in debates about the relationship between the executive, parliament and the media, most recently in the context of something called the Leveson Report, a judicial inquiry into phone tapping and other criminal activities by the tabloid press. And as Her Majesty's Solicitor General uh, from 2010 to 2012, one of the two government law officers, I had, amongst other things, uh, to protect the rule of law and the administration of justice by policing our laws of contempt of court by making sure that the media and individuals didn't publish information that could prejudice court proceedings, uh, particularly criminal trials. And these experiences uh, highlight uh, three critical areas of significance in any democracy. First, the independence and role of the legal profession and the judiciary. Second, the role of the executive in implementing and sustaining the rule of law. And third, the role and the significance of a free and independent and thriving press. Now, there's no uh, single orthodox definition of the rule of law, uh, but I propose to adopt that of the late Lord Bingham, one of our recent, uh, sadly late, uh, uh, one of our most recent uh, and eminent jurists. Uh, and he wrote in his uh, pithy book uh, entitled The Rule of Law uh, this, the core of the principle is that all persons and authorities within the sta state, whether public or private, should be bound by and entitled to the benefit of laws publicly made, taking effect generally in the future, uh, and publicly administered in the courts. The problem, of course, with any definition is that it's just that, a definition. We can only really understand the potential range and implication of any threats to the rule of law if we also understand that the rule of law is not just a formulaic definition devoid of content. It doesn't simply mean rule by law where the content of those rules is irrelevant. Although an essential and integral part of the rule of law is a clear, defined and prospective uh, legal framework, the mere codification and de jure existence of a set of principles doesn't suffice to protect and implement the rule of law. Let's take an easy example, Nazi Germany. Although elements of the Constitution were suspended after 1933, Hitler and his nationalist, National Socialist government were elected and governed ostensibly under the Weimar Constitution until their defeat in 1945. There are constitutional arrangements in all sorts of countries that on their face imply the existence of the rule of law, but which experience tells us does not exist sufficiently or even at all. <coughs> Zimbabwe has a constitution. It has elections and a recognizable judicial system. Russia and the Soviet Union before it has a constitution and a justice system. But I'm not sure I would want 
uh, to have any commercial or criminal dispute arbitrated in those jurisdictions, especially if a government or if the government or a friend of the president of either country had a more than passing interest in the matter. In contrast, the United Kingdom does not have a codified constitution. Our attachment to the rule of law is sustained by a series of historical conventions that have the force of law, by statutes approved by Parliament, the cumulative decisions of judges, and international treaties. And while our system may be par far from perfect, no one, I think, would sensibly suggest that the rule of law operated more effectively in Germany under the Weimar Constitution in 1938 or in Zimbabwe than it did or does in the United Kingdom then or now. Now, one of the greatest threats to the rule of law, therefore, is a literal and formulaic approach uh, to its implementation. It will be lost on no one, surely, in this room, that many of the greatest threats and inroads to the rule of law in the last 100 years have been said to have been taken uh, not only because they were in accordance with the law, but because they were necessary to protect the rule of law. And it, I can't remember now whether it was... Uh, Emerson or Dr. Johnson, who first came up with the, this line, but it doesn't matter for present purposes, but it seems to me apt when thinking about governments that claim to be taking away constitutional freedoms in order to protect them, to remember this. The more he talked of his honor, the, more, the faster I counted the spoons. Now, the lesson in history, it seems to me, is clear. When the executive itself invokes the need to protect the rule of law in the name of the public or national interest, all elements of society, the judiciary, the legislature, the media, and the people on whose behalf the executive acts need to be at their most vigilant to ensure that the fundamental principles which underpin the rule of law are not eroded or being misused. The public interest and the maintenance of the rule of law are frequently used to justify incursions into the principle of the rule of law on the basis that they are necessary for the safety of the public and the preservation of the state. In the late 20th and early 21st centuries, the threat posed by international terrorism has particular, uh, particular significance uh, in this context. Clearly, if the state succumbs to its external enemies, the rule of law will be lost and democracy overthrown. Yet equally, if the state doesn't uphold the basic principles of law and justice when faced with such threats, its citizens may well be in no better place than if it had succumbed to the external threat. Only a few years ago, in the final months of the Labour government that lost office here in the general election of 2010, it tried to introduce 90-day detention without charge. And I stress without charge, uh, not pre-trial, in suspected uh, cases of terrorism. My party, the Conservative Party, was against it. The Liberal Democrats, our current coalition partners, were against it. And sufficient members of the Labour Party were against it to ensure that the government dropped its plans. Under our system, the government is accountable to Parliament, and here was an example of a government with on paper a commanding majority in the House of Commons having to bow to the democratic will of Parliament. Of course, the threat of terrorism in the United Kingdom was and remains high, but very few members of Parliament wanted to protect liberty by eroding it. In the words of the 17th century English philosopher John Locke, uh, who, wherever law ends, tyranny begins. I've already said that an independent and fearless judiciary and an independent and fearless legal profession are fundamental to the maintenance of the rule of law. And no better example of this can be found in the uh, House of Lords case, our then highest court of appeal, uh, decided in 1941. It was all about uh, the Home Secretary's powers to detain those whom he had reasonable cause to suspect uh, of being of hostile association. Uh, the case is called Liversidge and Anders Anderson. I'm sure those of you who are law students know it off by heart. It's worth reading all five of the judgments handed down in the House of Lords, uh, but if you only read one, uh, the dissenting judgment of Lord Atkin is the one to go for. Uh, in giving it, in fact, he lost uh, the friendship of the other uh, judges. However, uh, this is what he said. I view with apprehension the attitudes of judges who on a mere question of construction went face to face with claims involving the liberty of the subject, show themselves more executive minded than the executive. In this country, amid the clash of arms, remember this is 1941, the laws are not silent. They may be changed, but they speak the same language in war as in peace. It's always been the pillars of freedom, one of the uh, principles of liberty for which on recent authority we are now fighting. 
uh, that the judges are no respecters of persons and stand between the subject and any attempted encroachments on his liberty by the executive, alert to see that any coercive action is justified in law. I merely note that as recently as last year, the then Prime Minister, now the President of Turkey, was reported as making critical comments about Turkey's constitutional court's decisions concerning Twitter. Uh, uh, and he made this remark, this constitutional institution is defending the commercial law rights of international companies, i.e. those behind Twitter, while it should be defending the rights of the public. Everyone should know their place and their boundaries. Everyone should know their authority. Well, no doubt we should all know our place uh, and where the boundaries are, but I'm just not sure that a politician, and I speak as a politician, is the right person to tell the citizen or the judge what his place should be or what the boundaries that separate the powers within the Constitution uh, and the constitutional settlement should be. And in understanding the importance of the rule of law, politicians and judges alike would be wise to recall all of Lord Atkins' uh, speech, his judgment in that case I have referred to, and in particular his concluding remarks when he refuted the majority's strained interpretation of the statute in order to give the Home Secretary, the Interior Minister, uh, broader powers to detain persons in time of war. I know of only one authority which might justify the suggested method of construction. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said, in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. Now, we lawyers, of course, are highly skilled, I hope, when practiced uh, and, and well practiced uh, at uh, making words uh, mean so many different things. But the fundamental principles which underpin the rule of law are, I would suggest, immutable. It's perhaps understandable that politicians who are responsible for maintaining national security uh, and who are accountable to their electorate may see a short-term solution to knotty and difficult questions. The role of an independent judiciary is to see the broader consequences of any erosion of the rule of law and to act as a check on the power of the executive. And it was Lord Bingham, who I quoted at the outset, who stated that there are countries in the world where all judicial decisions find favor uh, uh, with the powers that be, but they are probably not places where any of us would wish to live. Judicial independence is therefore an essential constituent of the rule of law. Uh, if the guardians of the rule of law don't or cannot strive to preserve the rule of law, well then there is little hope for the ordinary citizen and the maintenance of democracy. And threats to the rule of law uh, come in many forms. Corruption in the public or the private sector is one of the more invidious and obvious forms of it, undermining both the uh, principle of equality before the law and the consensual social acceptance of the rule of law. Now, traditionally, in this country, in this jurisdiction, uh, we have had low levels of corruption. And we've been loath, loath to do much more about it, to bring the laws against bribery and corruption more up to date, not least because we find it extremely difficult to define what is a corrupt payment or a gift. It was always easier to uh, recognize than to describe. So we left the law as it had been for about 100 years. Now, the Bribery Act 2010 is now widely regarded as one of the toughest in the developed world, not least because it uh, includes a, a section which criminalizes the failure to have systems in place to prevent corruption. But it shows the importance of evolving and developing measures to protect the rule of law, not remaining static and complacent. Complacency is, of course, itself a major threat to the rule of law, but I complacently like to think that the Bribery Act demonstrates a lack of complacency on the part of British uh, legislators. Briefly and uh, quickly, if I may, um, other issues to flag up, I think, in, in uh, considering the rule of law are access to justice. Uh, you know the old cliche, uh, the courts of England are open to all, like the doors of the Ritz Hotel. If you cannot afford justice, if you cannot afford access to justice, uh, you do not have justice at all. And I, I like to illustrate this point by a case last year in which there was a major fraud case uh, in one of the Crown Courts here in London, uh, at which the defendants, and there were several of them, successfully applied to the judge to have the case against them stopped on the basis that they could not get access to justice 
because they were not entitled to legal aid, but they could not afford uh, to hire their own lawyers. Uh, a barrister, in the best traditions of the bar, uh, appeared for them free of charge uh, and managed to get the judge to stop the case against them uh, on the basis of uh, inability to gain access uh, to justice. Uh, they were successful, uh, and the judge found against the prosecution, or, or delayed the prosecution, not on the basis that he was politically biased, but because he was, uh, as he said, supporting the rule of law and access to justice. Uh, a further interesting point about that case is that the barrister who appeared free on behalf of the defendants was none other than the current Prime Minister's older brother. Uh, so there we have a, a rather delicious example of, of uh, politics and the law clashing, if you like, uh, but being resolved uh, in favour of the rule of law, albeit that the judge uh, was finding against a policy of the brother of the barrister appearing in front of him. I like to think that would happen in all of our jurisdictions if it were necessary. Uh, I think I've probably said enough, and I hope I've said enough to uh, encourage uh, your thinking juices uh, to flow. Uh, uh, and uh, I do hope that we will engage uh, very shortly uh, after we've heard Professor Bogdanel uh, in uh, an interesting uh, question and answer session. Uh, but uh, please. I hope if you ask me any questions, uh, you will not feel restricted uh, to the, the subject that, that I have spoken of. Thank you, Philip. Right, now over to Professor Bogdanov. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I've been asked to talk about the connection between Magna Carta and modern constitutions. Now, of course, uh, Magna Carta long precedes what we think of as democracy, and it was first assented to, as you know, 800 years ago by King John. Some, sometimes people say it was signed by King John. In fact, it was sealed. It's not clear whether King John could actually write, so uh, it, it wasn't, certainly wasn't signed by him. But although... Um, it was sealed 800 years ago. It does remain a living presence. And a few years ago, uh, an opinion poll in Britain suggested that most people believe that Magna Carta Day, which is the 15th of June, should be a national holiday. And this was a rebuke to those who thought it had been forgotten. And one um, British comedian some years ago said in a radio program, Magna Carta, did she die in vain? Um, as I say, it precedes democracy by very many years. Now, Magna Carta has 63 clauses, of which three remain. The rest have been repealed or superseded. But the ones that remain are very important. And the first one of great importance says roughly that no one shall be imprisoned or have force used against him except by the law of the land. That's the principle of the rule of law. And to no one will we seek to deny or delay right or justice. And these are, of course, fundamental constitutional principles. Now, Magna Carta also says the king cannot tax his subjects without their consent. And the question then follows, who can give that consent? And the answer must be a parliament. And some 50 years after Magna Carta, uh, a parliament did indeed come into existence, uh, an instrument by which the king could obtain consent. And these are the fundamental principles, I think, that make Magna Carta so important that government must be subject to the law. Now, um, we, we've taken a rather curious path in Britain, uh, which most other countries have not followed, because we've believed that these rights can be safeguarded almost entirely by Parliament. Uh, our basic principle, as you probably know, is that of parliamentary sovereignty, that Parliament can do whatever it likes. And someone said in the 18th century that Parliament can do what it likes except turn a man into a woman 
and a woman into a man. But even that is false because if, according to law, Parliament decides a man is a woman, then that is the law. So Parliament can do what it likes. Now, if Parliament's sovereign, there's no point having a constitution. Parliament can do what it likes. And you can sum up the British Constitution in just eight words. Whatever the Queen in Parliament enacts is law. Now, we're very unusual in not having a constitution. There are only two other countries, other democracies, rather, which don't have constitutions. One that is in the Commonwealth, New Zealand, and one that is not, uh, Israel. There are just three democracies in the world without constitutions. But almost every other democracy has taken a different path, and they were led by the United States. Because, of course, the principle of Magna Carta, no taxation without representation, played an important part in the revolt of the American colonies in the 18th century. And the English political philosopher Edmund Burke, who supported the colonists, said the Americans were absolutely entitled to sit down at the feast of Magna Carta. And the Fifth Amendment to the American Constitution in the Bill of Rights says that no person can be deprived of life, liberty and property without due process of law. And that, of course, echoes Magna Carta, the clause in Magna Carta that I read, the 39th clause. And I, I think it's because America has a constitution that actually you often find that the Americans worship Magna Carta much more than the British. And uh, I think the president of the Magna Carta Association, the celebrations, is in fact an American. Um, now, uh, the Americans were the first to have a, a written constitution which still survives. And I think constitutions have three main purposes. The first is to uh, provide a sense of purpose, a kind of rallying cry for the citizen. And, for example, the American Constitution has a preamble in which it says its purpose is to form a more perfect union, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defence, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity. And some people who've argued that Britain should have a constitution say that British values, whatever they may be, should be in the constitution, and that this would help codify the values of citizenship and make it easy for, particularly for young people and those coming to Britain from abroad, to understand what Britain stood for. And perhaps a constitution could be the basis of civics lessons in the schools and those who seek British citizenship would be required to understand and swear allegiance to it as they are in America. Now, the second aim of a constitution, I think, is to provide what you might call an organisation chart of government. That is to clarify what the functions are, uh, functions of the legislature, the executive, the judiciary, and the interrelationships between them. And the first codified constitutions of which we have knowledge, that of the old Greek city-states, were really little more than organisation charts which laid out the functions. Now, just as any game requires a set of rules, I mean, if you join a tennis club, you'll ask what the rules are, and you'll get uh, a, an organisation chart and who can interpret the rules. And really, any society needs some sort of guide in that way, which is provided by the Constitution. But with the advent of the American Constitution, and most later ones, you get a third function, which I think is the most important. Because the constitutions of the Greek city-states and early constitutions provided for limited government, but the American constitution was the first to provide for limits on what the people themselves, what the majority, could do. And that is something totally new. Early constitutions had provided rights against government, but the American constitution and most modern constitutions provide rights against the citizen, or rather the majority, because the founding fathers of the American system were anxious to resist what came to be called the tyranny of the majority. And that, in a way, is implicit in Magna Carta, that even if the majority want to deprive someone of life or liberty without due process of law, even if the majority want to do it, they shouldn't be allowed to do it. And this is of fundamental importance. Now, um, the American Bill of Rights does safeguard that by saying that, for example, the First Amendment says there shall be no restrictions on freedom of speech or religion. 
So even if the majority want to impose those restrictions, they can't do so, and the Supreme Court prevents them from doing so. It's very different from the British system of the sovereignty of Parliament. And of course, you can't, the majority can't alter the Bill of Rights. You can't alter it by simple majority. There's a special procedure needed to amend the American Constitution and most other constitutions. And uh, of course, if a constitution could be altered by simple majority, what's the point of having it at all? So in America, to alter the constitution, you need the consent of two-thirds of Congress and three-quarters of the American states, which of course is difficult to achieve. And for that reason, in well over 200 years, you've had only 27 amendments to the American Constitution. So this is the third purpose of a constitution, which I think is fundamental, to secure not only the rights of individuals against the government, but the rights of individuals against the majority. Now, of course, today, government under the law means much more than it did in the 13th century. And that is expressed, I think, in the Commonwealth Charter, which the Queen signed uh, in 2012. And that goes beyond Magna Carta. You might call it a maximum charter, a charter for the modern age. And it makes it clear that a well-functioning democracy cannot exist without respect for the rule of law. And it's fair to say that Britain, in Britain and most other democracies, the rule of law came first. Magna Carta has nothing to do with democracy, it's the rule of law. We didn't really become a democracy, I think, till 1950, when we had one person, one vote. And women over 21 didn't get the vote till 1928. So democracy is comparatively recent in Britain, but the rule of law is much older. And I think there's a, co the, there's a basic conflict between these two principles of democracy and majority rule and the rule of law saying that majorities are restricted in what they can do. And uh, in Britain, in the 17th century, constitutional reformers repudiated the idea of the divine right of kings. And I think in the modern world, we need to repudiate the idea of the divine right of majorities. Because we now know, and I think 20th century experience has taught us, that democracies can be as despotic, if not more despotic, than traditional authoritarian governments. And what perhaps is the worst dictatorship in human history, which is that of Hitler in Germany, came to power as a result of being the leading party in two indubitably free elections. And indeed, uh, Hitler himself said in 1941 that the National Socialist Revolution defeated democracy through democracy. And I think it's worth noting that in 1980, Iranians voted in a free election for a theocratic republic in which human rights are, are really uh, very badly abused. So the basic fallacy, I think, which we all ought to bear in mind, the fallacy is that in a democracy, a majority that has one power in a free election has the right to govern as it wishes. It doesn't. It must respect the rule of law. And good government requires not only majority rule, but also respect for human rights, and in particular the rights of minorities. So government must be subject to the law. And I think it the best sign of a constitutional democracy is that no one is above the law. Now, very famously in America in 1974, President Nixon, uh, after the Watergate scandal, said when accused of criminal offences, that if a president does something, it cannot be illegal. But that was proved to be false, and President Nixon was forced to resign to avoid impeachment. And in Britain, one of our leading judges, Lord Denning, master of the rolls, in the 1970s, reminded the minister in a case, be you ever so high, the law is above you. Uh, of Magna Carta, a medieval historian said of Magna Carta that the king was under God, but also under the law. And that is why I think we're celebrating Magna Carta today, that it establishes a principle that, in my mind, is more important than democracy, namely the principle that all governments, including democratic governments, perhaps especially democratic governments, are governments under the law. Thank you. Right, thank you very much indeed.
Right, we've heard from both speakers. They've uh, provided an overview and indeed raised um, rather important questions. Um, I'll just remind you of what I think they've raised. Um, how does one not only define the rule of law, but how does one actually embody it in the culture? How do you make sure it's ingrained and not imposed? How do you maintain the rule of law at times of national crisis? How do you ensure access to justice? Who protects the rule of law? And Professor Bogner's really last point, um, or deriving from his last point, who actually decides the values that will take precedence over the majority? So I think some of those, uh, those are some of the questions that arise um, from uh, what we've heard.